This is part three of the series which covers the final segment in the book on neuropsychiatric issues, the diagnosis forms Dr. Pieper has created, and his final thoughts on FQAD, also known as fluoroquinolone associated disability. There are different side effects um, in the in the um, central nervous system which needs to be um, um, which 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 needs to be um, uh, explained, you know. So one of it um, is uh, is is the the the, um, the neurotoxic effect of fluoroquinolone drugs, mm -hmm. um, which is not only on the central nervous system but also on the peripheral nervous system. Mm -hmm. um, in the brain, this can cause, for example, tinnitus, which is uh, a loud noise in your ringing ears. in the ears. And then there are some symptoms like vertigo or nausea, mm -hmm. which are connected to this um, neurotoxic effect. Mm -hmm. But they are also due to the GABA system. And, uh, and this, um, that's why I call it neuropsychiatric um, side effect, because there is a an effect of the nerves um, of the central nervous system, but also um, there is an impairment in the functioning of the GABA system. And GABA, it's gamma amino butyric acid, is, mm -hmm. a, is a neurotransmitter in the brain, which is very, very important for the brain because it's the only neurotransmitter in the brain which calms you down. There are lots of different uh, neurotransmitters with, which are going to uh, to excitate, to, uh, to- Excite um, the system. Yeah, excite yeah. the system, uh, like adrenaline, no adrenaline, dopamine, glutamine, uh, lots of them. Uh, but there's only one neurotransmitter which is bringing you down, which is calming you down, uh, which has got a relaxing effect on you, uh, which helps you to sleep, which tells you, well, don't worry, never mind, there's nothing wrong with you, and, mm -hmm. and please don't worry. This is called GABA. This is the GABA system. And if the GABA system is not working well, then of course, you have all the symptoms you just you mm -hmm. just said mm -hmm. um, because um, you are getting agitated and anxious and fearful and you can't sleep anymore and you have got even this psychotic symptoms mm -hmm. like hallucinations and um, this personal personalization disorder you don't know yourself anymore really is this really a nightmare can you maybe explain that a bit more because that's very co common in the community that um what, what what would that feel like to, to the average person that took a drug when they start to maybe realize this is this is more this is a problem well, what would that look like the depersonalization <laughs> Like you don't think things feel like things are real, like you don't have a grip on what's reality or daydream, kind of yeah. that feeling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's also called derealization, okay. of course. Mm -hmm. But um, the the thing is that you are you are not really um, um, knowing yourself anymore, mm -hmm. right? So this is a real nightmare. I, I um, just told the story. Um, about the average patients I have, the well, it's not, it's only an example, but um, imagine a, a young, healthy person. Uh, there is a urinary blood and urinary tract infection, and um, this person wants to get healthy as soon as as it as she can. Right. She goes to the doctor, and he gives you this this pill and and this person is taking this pill in the evening and and she wakes up in the morning and is in severe in horrible pain and 
your, the legs are burning, the muscles mm -hmm. are in pain. Or twitching. And twitching as well. Mm -hmm. And she tries to go to the bathroom, but she can't really walk anymore. Mm -hmm. and the eyes are sore and there is headache and dizziness and, and nausea. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then she goes to the bathroom and looks in the mirror and there is somebody looking at her and she doesn't recognize and realize who this person is and it's yeah. not herself or himself. Right. So it's really that frightening. You can't imagine it's, it's the worst oh, yeah. nightmare you could have. And you yeah. go back to your bed and there is probably your girlfriend or your boyfriend lying there and you tell them everything and you're going to the doctor with him or her. And the doctor says, well, we will sort that out. Don't worry. And he finds nothing. And yeah. he sent you to the neurologist and he finds nothing. And your girlfriend is looking at you and you know that she, she is thinking, well, there's something wrong with you. And then, yeah. says, and then the doctor says this three words, or is it four words? This is all in your brain. This mm. is all in your head. Yeah. And then the problem starts really, you know, then the doctor mm -hmm. will send you to a psychiatric I hospital. Try. And then you spend the, the another six months in this hospital and getting drugs and getting um, uh, um, antidepressant uh, uh, drugs and things like that. But you are not going to get better with that because you haven't got any illness. There is no illness there. Yeah. There is no condition. You. Th this is not like a patient with multiple sclerosis who can say, well, I'm a poor guy now. I have got multiple sclerosis and I can't move my legs anymore. Mm -hmm. And then the medical community and his family, they will embrace him and they exactly. will say, well, oh, yeah. we're, taking, we're taking care for you. And there, there, there is help and, mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, don't worry and never mind. And uh, financially you are, you are safe and, and you have got this social net. Everything has changed from from one minute to the next. Yeah. And nobody really helps you in this situation. And yeah. this is awful. And I mean, it's it's not only yeah. that there are a lot of different symptoms coming going around in in your body, mm -hmm. but the the ethical or social uh, problem which are connected to that you lose your job and you lose your girlfriend and your family is looking at you like you are um, yeah. you are crazy and um and you know all these is the worst nightmare you can imagine yeah. in a modern it's a living world. hell it's a living a hell modern, yeah, yeah in a modern world sarah no, no we are not living uh, uh, 200 years ago in, in 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 you know in some village without a doctor or something mm -hmm. we are living in a in a modern world and and um there there are these patients and this is a huge number of patients uh, um, which which uh, have to live through this nightmare mm -hmm. and you you can't imagine how often I hear stories like this in my in my office. Yeah, it's and this is the point that people start um, we start having the suicides taking place because those people have lost all their support. They've lost a lot of their capabilities. It's just it's like an avalanche that's mm -hmm. so overwhelming that I don't think anybody who hasn't been through it, you know, uh, so you can understand. It yeah, could compre that's, comprehend. It's just, uh, and that's the reason why I find this GABA symptom so dramatic. Because mm -hmm. if you go to the doctor with your ruptured tendon, well, then he, at least he see that there is something wrong exactly. with you. Exactly. Yeah. You know? but if you say you have got this burning feet and this muscle pain, mm -hmm. and then you say, but well, I'm nervous and agitated and I have got this panic attacks and I can't sleep anymore. Then the, 
the doctor is connecting the dots, as you always say. There, he's connecting the dots, but a long way. He said he uh -huh. thinks, well, this is a, a psychosomatic case, or oh, just sure. even a psychiatric case, and this guy has to go to the psychiatric psychiatric hospital with that. Mm -hmm. So connecting the wrong dots, really. Mm. And then um, the story is going from bad to worse. Yeah. Uh, yeah, this is, is, is a very sensitive topic for the community, for sure. Um, we know many sad stories <clears throat> of suicide and want to mention that on uh, that we will provide our website link at the end of this uh, interview process that people can go find the support groups if they feel like they have been damaged by these four clones. And this is all sounding very um, much like what they're going through. There are so many others that are in the same boat and we're there to support <clears throat> each other. And it's, it's interesting because the support groups, um, you know, you, you might live a world away, but you're all going, you're going through a lot of the same things and it's invaluable to really helping people um, try to get through this process. Um, anyhow, so we know that these psychological problems can start within hours of this, of the first pill. Um, so we want to tell the audience, please know that these antibiotics can be dispensed, as we said before, as ear drops, eye drops, IVs, during surgery or in a pill form. So yourself, as well as others, believe that some of these psychiatric side effects may be related to, to the issues of the uh, antibiotics damaging the GABA, like we've, uh, we've um, explained. Do you think, um, I guess the main thing here, you know, especially in the United States, is that you're going to get put on an antidepressant, but there's a lot of things, natural things you can do, <clears throat> as we discussed for GABA. Um, which was in the previous episode. Uh, and many, many of the community suffered from terrible insomnia where they're sleeping maybe one or two hours a night. And uh, your body needs sleep to repair itself. This is a huge problem that the right tests are not done really. So yeah. for example, um, in, my, in my patients in, in the neuro psychiatric patients, I do a lot of uh, GABA testing, but you can't do, you can't test GABA in the blood. So you have to, mm. to, to test it either in the urine or in the uh, saliva. Uh, saliva. saliva yeah. 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 So, and then you see um, quite often um, that the GABA system is really, really low very very low and that the body wants to produce more GABA um, for the system to get better mm -hmm. right so because the underlying problem here is that the fluorokinolone molecules uh, they block the GABA receptors and to um, to overcome this action you need to have a lot more of GABA in the system to uh, to to um, to get rid of the fluorokinolone molecules at this GABA receptors. Mm -hmm. um, so we have to bring the brain to produce more GABA, um, and it is not possible to give GABA in the system because the brain, the blood-brain barrier, will prevent the GABA uh, go in the brain in a in a large amount so you have to give the precursor of GABA and if you give the precursor of GABA like some amino acids and vitamins and minerals then the brain can produce the GABA itself and after two months or three months when I do the second test of GABA mm -hmm. then you can see that the amount of GABA in the brain is elevated a hundred times. You wow. can't imagine what the brain is doing with wow. the GABA. And, and, and that is then after a couple of months, this neuropsychiatric uh, neuro symptoms are gone usually. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
in some patients that they uh, they stay but um, 70 80 percent of the patients are getting rid of these symptoms after three to six months yeah um, if you if you help with GABA if you have help, help with melatonin which is Melatonin, yeah. Sleeping hormone in your brain, and you can give me melatonin in quite high dosages. Actually, you can give it with three milligrams, six and nine, and even twelve milligrams wow. of melatonin. Okay. And you can give it as a as a slow release melatonin as well, mm -hmm. so it will stay all the night. Uh, because many of the patients they have got a sleeping disorder. Mm -hmm. And they can they can fall asleep, but they will um, they will they will wake up at three or four o'clock. Yeah. Then they are not able to get to sleep anymore. Mm -hmm. So um, and for these patients, the the um, the slow release melatonin is is a is a better solution. And, Magnesium and works really well too for sleep. Sorry. Mag Magnesium works very well. Magnesium for sleep also, well. yeah, yeah. yeah there, there, are, there are a lot um, of different um, possibilities to get uh, the brain more protected as well. Yeah. You know, the brain needs the brain needs a lot of protection, and, and melatonin as well is a is a very good antioxidative drug. Mm -hmm. um, so there are different kinds of actions which are really positive in melatonin, um, but also choline. Choline is a is a um, choline. Choline. Yeah. Choline. 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 It's a it's a it's a very important amino acid, mm -hmm. um, which is very important for the mitochondrial membrane, but also for the brain. Mm -hmm. And there's a, a pro drug is called cytocholine, and cytocholine is something which uh, in the U.S. Uh, were often used in stroke patients as well. Hmm. I haven't heard of that. Okay. So that is really important, the cytocholine. Um, and so there, there are really different kinds of um, of uh, therapies, remedies, yeah. Okay. Different kind of options um in this case you know what do you think from the, all the patients you've seen what what just so the audience knows what are people really getting diagnosed if they go to their regular doctor what are they what are kind of diagnoses are you seeing probably um uh, chronic fatigue is just one but uh, name some others that people would know be familiar with that maybe are, are in are in an incorrect uh uh, what do you call it an incorrect diagnosis that people are getting what do you see mm -hmm. well most of them are having the psychosomatic psychosomatic diagnostic or mm -hmm. even a psychosis or depression mm -hmm. but there are, uh, is a lot of uh, fibromyalgia myalgia, fibromyalgia, fibromyalgia yeah, mm -hmm. yeah myalgia. Multiple sclerosis uh, here. That's, that's not a lot one. PTSD, like post-traumatic stress disorder. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, of course, chronic fatigue, which is not which is not really wrong the diagnosis, mm -hmm. but but it's not really the diagnosis I I wanted to hear. I want to hear. Mm -hmm. um, there's a diagnosis which is quite rare, but some neurologist um, gives them. Um, this is a myalgia crampus fasciculation syndrome, huh. which is very interesting because um, it's not that far away from the truth. Mm -hmm. uh, syndrome. There is an English expression to that. It's uh, called cramp fasciculation syndrome in in in, mm. in English and in, in the US. Okay. And this syndrome is actually um, very common with moxifloxacin, with Avalox. Yeah. The Avalox patients, they have got this twitching muscles and um, this fibrillization with, with this um, fasciculation of the muscle, which is, you can really see the muscle moving under mm -hmm. the skin, 
I have yeah. got a lot, lots of videos about that from the patients. They sent me the video and you can see the muscle moving um, like a worm, like, yeah. a, like a living animal under the skin, you know? Yeah. And, and they are in pain, of course. Uh, they have cramps, of course. And this is a so-called myalgia, myalgia crampus fasciculation syndrome. Mm. Um, and this is a kind of a syndrome which I use quite often because um, I need some ICD diagnosis for this. Diagnostic this codes, yeah. Diagnostic codes. and. And this is not so far away from the truth. And um, as well, uh, CFS is not so far away from the truth. Chronic so, fatigue syndrome, yeah. Chronic fatigue syndrome. Um, so I try to, to, to um, have this diagnosis involved in my... Mm -hmm. um, in my um, medical reports. So you mentioned that the, the, the current FQAD, FQAD diagnosis is, is not, criteria is not specific nor sensitive enough. And this could lead to, as we just said, uh, getting diagnosed with something else which you really don't have and uh, missing crucial factors to get that person well. Um, so, in, uh, in the section of your book, you've created and included several pages of a few different types of diagnostic criteria forms that would be extremely helpful for both patient and doctors and mentioned that um, these are to determine if the patient actually is suffering from FQAD, just not a few regular side effects like nausea and headaches. Um, you, ha you have a long diagnostic form version, which is very detailed, um, and, and uh, as far as fluoroquinolone's uh, side effects can go, and um, which cause many adverse reactions that cascade into each other. Can you touch on a few highlights and differences between your long and short form? I had a look at every single side effect which I could get my hand on, mm -hmm. um, which was which is caused from fluoroquinolones. Yeah, uh, most of them are in the leaflet. The A symptoms I used was the leaflet symptoms, and then I used the okay. B symptoms. That was these are the scientific studies, and then there are some, not very much, but some uh, C symptoms which are symptoms that I have the experience that they are very, very often in the FQAD community. All the symptoms I put together um, in a questionnaire, which uh, has actually 16 pages, and every patient of mine, every, patient, every FQAD patient of mine has to fill out this big questionnaire. Another um, questionnaire done with only two pages, mm -hmm. um, which, which gives you a very, very good overview of the most important symptoms. So, uh, you know, there's, there's such things as relapses. What kind of cycles do you see happening with your patients? Well, the relapses uh, is, is probably one of the most frustrating events um, if you treat um, fluoroquinolone associated disability, because you need a, usually at least a couple of months to get your patient better. Mm -hmm. So I have got this bell scale, uh, and that is a the scale. disability scale, yeah, in your book. Scale in, in my book. And Bell was a, a very, very good um, American doctor who. Mm -hmm a lot of research about chronic fatigue disorder oh. in, uh, in, in uh, uh, decades ago. And I used this scale for chronic fatigue syndrome uh, like at least 15 or 20 years mm -hmm. because it's very, very helpful. Okay. And even the university, the Charité, the University of Berlin is using that. Um, and I found it uh, very practical for um, fluoroquinolone 
toxicity as well. So mm -hmm. I use the Bell scale for the flu fluorquinolone patients as well. Uh, zero or 10 or 20 means um, this patient is really disabled, you know, mm -hmm. bedridden. And then after a while, you get this patient from 20 to 30 or from 30 to 40. And, uh, and that takes a lot of time. That takes yeah. a lot of patience. Slow process. Right? So, yeah. um, needs three, four, five, six months to get a patient from 30 to 40 or 50. Mm. And, uh, and once, you, once he's getting there, um, you're happy and he's happy. Yeah. Then there is a relapse um, all of a sudden. And sometimes you don't really know why this is happening. But, but there are, of course, lots of um, other triggers like fluorquinolone, for example, other antibiotics, for example, yeah. um, even small, small dosages um, in not organic food. Because one has to know, has to know that um, that the animals are treated as fluorquinolones mm -hmm. in, the, in an amount five to 10 to 20 fold of, of human beings. There is another condition which is actually um, closely connected to the fluorquinolone huh. um, intoxication. Yeah. And this is called mast cell activation. Oh, syndrome. Mast cell, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and and these MCAS, it, it it's the uh, it's it's the name. Yeah, MCAS um, is 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 actually quite common in FQAD patients. Yeah. So um, the the fluorquinolones the fluorquinolones is uh, a huge trigger for mast cell activation, and on the other hand, um, patients with mast cell activation problem. Uh, they are very, very sensitive, mm -hmm. and this can cause a relapse in fluor in the fluorquinolone syndrome. If if I look back, then uh, there are lots of patients uh, with uh, this problem, and mm -hmm. and the actual patients I have got at the moment, there I mean, at least quarter of them, twenty five percent of them, maybe uh, they have got a problem with mast cell activation really which is usually a rare a rare condition i know you've been involved in a few studies um and we, we're aware of uh, scientists here and there working on fluoroquinolone um causes such as genetics over in great britain um did you want to talk anything about what you've you've concluded for some of the studies that you've been involved with or what you might be doing in the future Mm. Well, I have just mentioned that uh, I do a little study with um, with a colleague of mine, this medical student uh, for small fiber neuropathy, mm -hmm. um, which I think is very important because yeah. um, it's really something which you don't find in the in the literature. Yeah, uh, there are no studies about that. There are only single case reports about yeah. cyprofloxacin. Uh, inducing small fiber. There is a case report about that, mm -hmm. but there are no bigger studies with with more patients. And we try to get at least 50, 60, or 70 patients um, in our study to have a good number. Um, there's a colleague of mine in the Charité in the University of Berlin. Mm -hmm. uh, who is doing uh, a lot of research about aortic aneurysm. Super. Um, fluorquinolone and aortic aneurysm. Okay. And we are doing uh, some work together. You know, the basis of our foundation is, is doing, uh, you know, laboratory research as well. So we do have some stuff posted on our site about the work mm -hmm. that we're doing. And I think the key is, you know, we we're so happy to meet you and, and to, to shine some hope, hope for the people out there that people are starting to talk amongst themselves. That we're, we're meeting on Facebook, we're meeting on Instagram and unusual places that you never would have in the past. And they're like, oh my gosh, you type in 
a certain word and there's the scientist that's working on something. And I, I really hope it just continues to keep growing like that. And then we, we keep introducing each other to people that yeah. we know that between all of us, we can piece this together and mm. start finding some answers and also doing um, some preventative measures. So people do not have to go through this, which would be wonderful. I mean, really incredible. Yeah. This about wraps up our final interview. And uh, first, I want to thank, thank you so much from the bottom of our hearts here at the foundation for all your, your time and, and, and especially all your dedication to all your patients. You're doing tremendous work. And the, um, the amount of compassion and care that you show is, is just off the charts. So we're really grateful. Thank you very much, Thank Sarah. you so much. This concludes the book interview series with Dr. Stefan Pieper. If you found this information beneficial, give us a thumbs up and please click the donation link in the description box below. Your tax-deductible donation will go towards outreach efforts and funding further research. All staff works pro bono. If you're an organization that would like to collaborate on a study with us, please go to our website contact page. To find a support group, visit our help page, also linked below. Thank you for watching, and we hope you check out Dr. Pieper's book.